Activism and community activists in Congress. This week, progressive Democrat Pramila Jayapal and community organizer Dominique Stevenson sit down with me in Baltimore to discuss what's in it for activists to run for office. And three years after the death and police custody of young Freddie Gray, we visit the city garden that's sprouting up across the street from where he lived. That's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. The Progressive Caucus Center Summit takes place every year in Baltimore, Maryland. Baltimore, Maryland is the place that you'll remember as the site of a municipal uprising after the killing of Freddie Gray. That story continues. The story that we reported at the time had to do with the community reaction here, which had everything to do with policing, but also to do with impoverishment of communities, segregation of schools, and lack of investment. It was also about a lack of a seat at the table for communities, in the sense that the Progressive Caucus Center Summit is also about changing something really big and institutional, the Democratic Party and politics in America. We wanted to bring together two change makers uh, to talk about how what model might exist for effective uh, democratic progressive change. So, from Baltimore, we have Dominique Stevenson. She was in our special, From a Moment to a Movement. She works with the American Friends Service Committee. She's a Baltimore resident and activist. Dominique, welcome, glad to have you. Thank you, glad to be here. And we're back. also very honored to have representative from Washington State, Democrat, Pramila Jayapal. No stranger to this program. Pramila is one of the co-chairs of the Progressive Caucus, and she's actually the chair of the summit that's happening here, held by the Progressive Caucus Center. So we appreciate you taking the time, Pramila. Thank you for having me. Would you say that's the project you're engaged in, Pramila, as I just kind of outlined it? Yes. I mean, I think we're engaged in, you know, obviously the result would be taking back the House in uh, November, but the bigger result is creating a country that has fair policies for cities and towns across the country. And Baltimore, I think, is one of the places where if we were to invest in infrastructure, for example, the Progressive Caucus has a big infrastructure plan, which isn't just about roads and bridges, um, but is also about schools. It's about water. It's about net, uh, the internet and making the internet accessible and available. Those are the kinds of policies that the Progressive Caucus is pushing. And it's for places like Baltimore, but we're also pushing policies around racial equity. And you know, when I think about the work that you've done, Dominique, here after the killing of Freddie Gray, um, we are a caucus that believes that racial justice, economic justice, gender justice are all part and parcel of the same thing. And your history, just to give Dominique a little sense of where you come from, you're a highfalutin member of Congress now, but you were an organizer for a long time. Yeah, I am an organizer still. I always say to people I'm, I'm an organizer first and, a, and an elected official second in some ways. But yes, my history has been um, of organizing in the streets around very tough issues. After 9-11, I started what is now the largest immigrant advocacy organization in Washington state. We were on the front lines of fighting for immigration reform. We sued the Bush administration around the deportation of Somalis, and we won. Um, and then we also got very involved in police accountability. I was one of the leaders in Seattle that signed on to a request to get the Department of Justice to come in and investigate the Seattle Police Department around uh, biased policing, was on the committee to raise the minimum wage to 15 in Seattle. So that's been my work, is really organizing people to bring folks like Dominique, frankly, and voices that are not at the table too often to the table. And I think that that's the work even in Congress is to use elected office as a platform to organize and to bring organizers from the outside and the inside, if you even want to call it that, 
um, together to really create that movement for change. All right, so your turn, Dominique. T t tell Pramila and me a little bit about your work and particularly how it's shaped up in the so last few years. So I, I actually started um, working with men in the Maryland prison system. A lot of those men had in some ways contributed to some of the issues in the community and wanted to figure out a way that they could develop a redemptive process in which they could go back or send young men who they were mentoring back into the community to, uh, to do work and to actually sustain community. And so we were there before um, the issue with Freddie Gray occurred, before Freddie Gray's death. But we had been simply just handing out bag lunches because hunger is a big issue in this community. We were in Sandtown, Winchester, right near the Gilmore Homes, which is where Freddie Gray was detained. So the men began by just simply handing out bag lunches. Um, that kind of progressed into doing more material, meeting people's material needs. And then when the uprising occurred, I think because people had seen us in the community, residents became a little bit more engaged with us. Um, things kind of moved into something larger. Um, we started doing farming. The governor announced, this was maybe a year after the uprising, announced mm -hmm. that there was going to be major demolition in West Baltimore. And I found that just simply problematic, that there's no renovation. You have a large homeless population here in the city. There's no emphasis on creating housing for people. Rather, you know, they're going to knock it down. They're going to bulldoze. So we decided to take over a house that was owned by the city. It was abandoned. We took it. We did a press conference to let them know we're here. We dubbed it Tubman House. Over time, we've negotiated with the city. We have let them do the demolition, but we have access to that land. And we're, what we plan to do is create a bio cellar, which is a large indoor submerged greenhouse so that we can do year round um, growing. So we're growing food there for the community, but we're also looking at cash crops like hops so that we will be able to create jobs. So everything that you've just described is very much sort of self-help, self-reliance, self-organized community action. Is there something that, you mentioned the governor, his role, is there something the government and a political party or elected representatives have done, could do, you'd like them to do? Have done here in Baltimore, I can't say. <laughs> you can't say because? Because I feel like um, Baltimore is largely controlled by developers, and I think that that controls who gets into political office. I will say in the last election for city council, there seems to be maybe a couple of progressive people who've been elected, but I have yet to see them really engage um, with community. But I think the thing that they can do, I mean, is while we're going through this process of demolition is look at how we can make this land available to people in the communities. Look at the actual communities that exist around this so-called blight. These people have been left, left there by the city government and now they simply want to come in and, and do demolitions and get rid of the population. And my fear is that they will then sell that land cheap or that property cheap to developers who will create housing and will create retail, but it's not designed for the people who are currently there. Um, the Gilmore Homes housing project itself is due to be demolished within, I think, two years. And the residents there have not received an actual plan. They don't know what's going to happen. They don't know how they will be relocated. So I think that those are things that elected officials can can be more accessible to the people. There is a disconnect here in Baltimore. Um, there is less than two miles from this hotel. There's a whole other world mm -hmm. that exists. Um, it's a world where the policing has continued to be aggressive. You know, where we work, it's not unusual for a helicopter to be overhead every day. Um, the drug trade thrives despite the fact that you have this aggressive policing more money goes into policing and goes into the Western District Police Station than goes into the schools there in Sandtown. They've closed several of the elementary schools and so some students are actually being bused out of their communities. So it, it, there, there is no economic development and for many there's no hope. Listening to this, Pramila, what are you thinking? Well, the first thing I think is that 
I think what Dominique's describing is a government that isn't working for all the people, right? I mean, it's not just that government needs to be more accessible when there are a whole bunch of problems, but we actually need to be doing everything we can to not have those problems exist, to address inequality, um, to address housing and schools. I mean, that is what government is supposed to do. You see how an elected official or a city council or government can make a difference. You know, when Bill de Blasio came in, he stopped stop and frisk. Um, in Seattle, we passed a $15 minimum wage that lifted the wages of people at the bottom up. Um, at the federal level, it's the same thing. We could work on comprehensive immigration reform. We could work on um, actually providing resources for the prevention of uh, a lot of the issues that drive people to drugs. Um, there's so many things that government should be doing that we're not. And I think the other thing I wanted to pick up on was what you said about developers controlling the agenda, because really what you're talking about is money and politics. You're talking about who uses government for their benefit. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the huge problems at every level of government, um, from local to Congress, is that there's corporate interests, the biggest corporations, the wealthiest individuals in a town or in the country who manipulate the system to work for them instead of for you know, the 90% of people who, who don't get any benefit from it. So I think of this as being exactly the problem with, with how government is working right now, but also the hope because it is people like you, I think, that address these issues at the ground and force attention. And you see that happening, um, you know, whether it's in your takeover of the land, which I just love, um, or whether it's in terms of the, the students in Parkland or, you know, the Me Too movement. It's people saying, no, we're going to force you to address this. It's, it's true in the sense that you showed it was possible to make a change because those locks magically changed. Um, does it feel possible to make a change around corporate power in the Democratic Party? It feels very difficult, I'll be honest. It is extremely difficult, and it feels like sometimes we, we sort of chew away at the edges, but what we really need is a reform of the system. It's not just Citizens United, which is hard enough to think about overturning, um, but it's also that we need public financing of elections. I mean, we did that in Seattle, the beginnings of it, with a, uh, a democracy voucher, which essentially uh, everyone would get it. So you would get $100, everybody would get it. Candidates, if they uh, apply for the democracy vouchers, they're limited in terms of how much they can raise overall. And it means that Dominique can go to the polling, you know, to send in, before she goes to the polling booth, send in her money for X candidate, and she's got the same as you or me or some corporate developer. Does that sound good to you, Dominique? It sounds good to me. <laughs> are, are you? A Neighbors, are your friends and colleagues engaged in elected political work right now? No, to, to be honest, I think a lot of people have divested from that process because uh, going back to what I was saying about the there's no hope. What people are seeing is not enough change that's really impacting their communities, that's going to impact their children's lives. And um, the elected process here in Baltimore and in Maryland sometimes feels like a farce. So what would it take to shift that? Once people have sort of divested and got discouraged, it's kind of hard to suck them back in. It is. I think that, one, it, it will, it's going to take a lot of work on the grassroots level. I think it, it requires um, growing up some of those candidates from the communities that we're working in. I think that people need to see people like themselves, people who understand their issues um, as their representatives. I think in the, the interim that, like I said, government needs to be more accessible to people. People mostly see these folks when there is an election mm -hmm. or on the news, you know, or when an event like the murder of Freddie Gray occurs. Then suddenly they're in the community and they're visible, but they're still not really engaging the community. So what concretely needs to happen? An I office have an set idea up in for Santa? what concretely could happen <laughs> is you could run for office. I mean, I'm not kidding. This is what is starting to happen that is transforming how government gets done because people who really are deeply rooted in the movement, in their community, who are organizers themselves, you see the pressure I'm putting on you, <laughs> my hands starting to yeah. move on, you know, but I mean, I think this is what matters. That's why I ran for office. I never thought I would be an elected official. 
it was not, I wanted to be on the other side because I had some disdain for elected officials, honestly. But then I realized that you and I, as women of color, are completely seeding the whole space of political organizing through elected office. And if you had somebody like Dominique, then she would do things differently. She would talk to people differently. She would be accessible. She would help to organize from the inside. She would push for different kinds of policies. And people would start to get reinvested in government. So I think you and I are going to have to have a chat after this. Could she get help from the Democratic Party? The candidates well, like she her? certainly could get help from individuals. You know, the congressional, the, the po party politics is all, uh, the congressional campaign committee sponsors candidates for Congress, but I would come out and campaign for you. I think your arm will be twisted behind your back if I don't stop this interview right now. Um, but I want to thank, thank you, you both, yeah. really appreciate it. Will you consider it, Dominique? Uh, I don't know about that. I, like you, I, I still have a lot of disdain for that process based on what I've experienced and seen here in Baltimore. Thank you yeah. both, Dominique Stevens and Pramila Jayapal. Appreciate it. And a quick correction from me, while she may in the future someday be a co-chair of the Progressive Caucus, right now she is the first vice chair of the Progressive Caucus. Thank you both. Thank you. People in the community where Freddie Gray lived, where Freddie Gray died essentially, people there are still struggling with day-to-day -day issues. We want our community to be reinvested in, but we want to be at the table. We want to be decision makers so that we can stay. If you ask us what we want in the community, we can, we can, we can tell you about it. But what happens is people come in and tell people, this is what's best for you. And part of what they feel is best for communities is just bringing in a certain race and class of folks. The last time I was living here, I was uh a young teen, and the block was full. Every house was occupied. And now in 2015, <laughs> every, every house is unoccupied. And it's not just here, it's the next block is similar. Um, this whole community is, is just ravaged. I would love to see more community control. For example, if you have public housing in your community, let the community work with the community in redesigning that property if it's run down. Let the community work some of those jobs to rebuild those run down properties. For every march, it's getting bigger, you know, it's getting louder. I see the, the movement growing. You know, for years I've been saying it. Since I've been with United Workers, I've been seeing more and more organizations coming in and speaking about the bigger issues, the questions that the media don't ask. Like, uh, what is the real underlining causes of all this, this madness? Why is there so much poverty? Why is the poverty so deep and, and so difficult to correct? Um, and who should be responsible? I don't just want a house. I want a community, you know? I want a community when I step outside, there are gardens growing fresh vegetables, you know? There are safe parks for the kids to play in. Uh, there are schools just, just you go by the school grounds and they're just so vibrant and happy, can't wait for the bell to ring to get in there. So we're here at 1722 Pressbury in the Sandtown Winchester neighborhood of Baltimore, West Baltimore actually. Um, this is an area that we've dubbed Tubman House. It was originally a physical structure, now it's more or less a community. And we're with Asar who is our farm manager here. Before this was here, um, there was houses here. Um, abandoned houses that have been dilapidated for years. They were tore down by the city and a lot was just left vacant. Um, it became a just like any other vacant lot that you see here in West Baltimore, it just became a dumping grounds and it was wasted space and it wasn't utilized. Um, what we did was we came here, we assessed the property, um, built some raised beds from reclaimed materials, got some compost and filled the beds with good compost and started cultivating everything from fruits to vegetables here. We have a, a chicken coop, we're gonna raise chickens. The structure here will actually be the chicken coop. 
that structure there is going to be where we do aquaponics. So we're going to have fish there. And we're also going to grow herbs and things um, that are, will be powered by the aquaponics. We also grow crops. We're doing um, hops eventually, you know, uh, to sell. Um, but we also do a lot of food for the community. So there are anything from like tomatoes, peppers, potatoes, onions, whatever people want, okra. We invite them to come participate. We also let them know this is for you. Everybody loves the chickens. Right now over there is Evil. She laid one egg and now she's getting ready to lay another. And blue eggs over here. The reason why we call her blue eggs is because, well, she lays blue eggs. I always love to come here and work with the chickens and help help them plant food and stuff. See, Evil, she laid two eggs. The 1619 Coalition, we took that name when we originally took the house from the city. We were illegally occupying it. I mean, we felt like we had moral law on our side. But we took it because 1618 is generally referred to as the date that the first Africans were enslaved in the U.S. I mean, it actually goes back a little further than that, but we felt like that was a point of reference. And the house itself that we occupied was 1618 Pressbury. So we were like, okay, we'll be the 1619 Coalition. And it was different folks, different activists, artists, and people who were engaged in the process of taking the house. Where does all this stuff come from? Okay, so the, the wood that made the raised bed boxes actually come out of these houses that are here. It's reclaimed wood that comes out of uh, abandoned houses that's been deconstructed. Um, these are old uh, joists, floor joists actually, they're made out of pine, some of it poplar. Um, the raised bed box wood is my, maybe about 60 years old, so it's a way of offsetting things that would just go to the landfill and reuse it. Um, what about the bricks? Now the bricks, the bricks actually come from other houses that are around here that have been deconstructed or some of them actually fell over. Um, and these bricks are over 100 years old. Um, and what we have with the hydroponics hut is that these true two by fours and two by sixes are also old wood. It is like pine wood and it's very dense wood. It's actually very beautiful, which otherwise would be thrown away, but it, it's very good for building, it's very strong. What's this over here? This is a building project here that we're doing is an um, a earthen fire earthen um, brick oven. Like a pizza so, uh, oven? Yeah, a pizza oven. I see. Earthen is there oven. Is pizza yeah. in your future? Uh, pizza, baked bread. You know, we saw this at another farm. We went to Detroit and it was, a, it was a real nice thing. They did something with the children for Earth Day. They made pizza and made bread. So it's something that we could also um, utilize. This is the future home of our bio cellar. Was searching the web, um, Rhonda and Dominique saw the video of Chateau Huff with Mansfield, and we said that this is something that we would like to do here. And we looked at the practicality of it, of it being a bio cellar. You could grow food all year round with less inputs, utilizing the old foundation of houses. That was something that we, we we're already into reusing um, reclaimed materials from the houses, but now this is a way to literally uh, reuse, reuse the whole structure. You know, so. Um, what you see here will have the same sort of setup with uh, uh, polycarbonate glass facing the south side of this and uh, sun shining down and utilizing the cellar as grow beds. We would do things like aquaponics and different sorts of plants and we'd be able to extend our growing season, possibly even doing some tropical fruit trees. You know, this is not anything new. This is things that people are doing all across the country. It's definitely part of the food movement, but it's to address um, food apartheid. So making this food available to the community, initially making most of the food free to the community where they can pick at their own um, time. And also it's a training ground. Building these raised bed boxes is a way to teach uh, vocational skills to the youth. Um, it's a way to tie in science and STEM. And today we have everything from rainwater catchment systems to building solar panels on top of the aquaponics um, shed. Um, also looking at dealing with other aspects as far as like growing the food, but also how to prepare it. So out here we do things like prepare smoothies, we prepare meals on stoves. You know, the children are able to sample these meals, make recipes, take them back to their families, and then duplicate them. You know, so they learn about culinary arts, health and wellness, and urban agriculture, as well as any other program we do here like literacy or um, tutoring. What we're doing here is we're building community. It's self-empowerment. It's how in our communities we 
redefine our own lives and we tell our own narrative, our own story, regardless of what the media states. You know, it's a lot of respect for these places that are here. Um, building this garden, it is a place that grows food, but it's also something that changed the physical structure of this neighborhood. You know, um, and that does something to the neighborhood. It does something for the spirit of the neighborhood. You know, it not only gives hope, but it's an example of what these vacant spaces should be used for. As far as statistics are concerned, it's ground zero for a lot of the hardship that you see in urban cities. You know, um, however, you know, it's also a place where the police department gets more funding than any other district in Maryland or any other county in Maryland. You know, so it's, you have a lot of money that's coming in here that's invested into policing, but not into the community, not into creating jobs, not into education for youth, not into supplementing people's uh, uh, diets or food. And, you know, so there, it's a lot of things that are missing here, you know, and this is just an example of how you can bring those things back.